Next up, we have a panel on communicating and building communities. We have a few, we have four people on the panel, and then I will be doing the moderating. So on our panel, we have Anama Kaved. She is Marketing and Communications Manager with Least Authority. We have Paige Peterson, who is User Education and Community Team Lead at Zcash. She's got experience with the P2P tech, storage startups, and enjoys exploring ways to simplify explanations of complex topics and hosting crypto parties. Freddie Martinez, the director of Lucy Parsons Labs. He's an activist, security engineer, and was previously a physicist. In 2017, he was a Mozilla Ford Foundation Open Web Fellow. And we've got Matt Mitchell, the founder of Crypto Harlem. He's also a hacker, security researcher, operational security trainer, developer, and data journalist. And myself. So, panelists. Um, so, first, I did a in quick introduction for you all, but I imagine you might have a little bit that you would like to add about yourselves and what you're working on currently. And um, I'd also like to frame it with, um, why did we even need to have this conference <laughs> on privacy for everyone? And why do we need to have a panel on um, communicating privacy and building communities? So yeah, tell us a little bit about yourselves, you're here, and what your thoughts are on why we need to have this conversation. Oh. Okay, sorry. My name is Anamika, and I work with Lease Authority. I do marketing communications for them. Um, and uh, we are actually thinking of a privacy awareness campaign because uh, both our company and personally, I feel that privacy is really important. And it's really important to communicate privacy to people because it is uh, becoming more and more important with increasing use of data in our social and economic interactions. Uh, I also feel it's really important to have uh, conferences like these because I'm a mom and personally I feel that our kids are actually uh, getting accustomed to life without privacy. Uh, they kind of think that it's normal to, to, for everyone to grow up in an environment where there is no privacy at all, so it's really important that we get together, brainstorm ideas, how to educate people about the importance of privacy for themselves and for the current generation and the kids. So I think it's a great, great uh, way to get together and discuss uh, new ideas. Um, hi, I'm Paige, and I work for Zcash. Um, I really enjoy doing community outreach and community education um, about privacy. It's a, it's a difficult challenge, but it's really rewarding when um, people start to understand uh, the importance of privacy. And I would agree that it's really important to have events um, just to like kind of generate the um, new ideas and just like generating new discussions that not, don't necessarily get sparked on the internet. Um, and in general, it's really important to educate people with privacy the more and more uh, technologies are being developed, um, you kind of want to get that momentum going where communities and individuals are pressuring uh, companies and software developers to actually uh, implement privacy and think about privacy and security um, for everyone. So, and as long as you get, you know, maybe a, a good momentum going, then you don't necessarily need to convince everyone that privacy is important, but like getting a, a core group of people I think is really key for going forward. Thanks Paige. You know, a lot of my work focuses on marginalized communities, people who are under threat. When we think about privacy, it's usually uh, surveillance and some outside, maybe intelligence community, things like this that are attacking our privacy, maybe commercial interests, them, whoever they are. But with marginalized populations and communities, their very identities are under threat. So I think privacy is for everyone, and especially for those who have the least privacy. And uh, you know, your privacy is your shield when your identity is under threat. When we're talking about things like cryptocurrencies, when we're talking about things like 
pirate parties and things that are decentralized, it's important to understand we are creating a new future, and in this new future, we don't need income inequality. In this new future, we need to do better than we've done in the past. And we're at a point where we can create a better world, or we can make a futuristic model of the same broken one. Thanks, Matt. Um, <clears throat> I was going to say very similar to what you were going to say, so I'll, I'll, I'll just, yeah, it's, it's cool. Um, I also, you know, I work at Freedom of the Press Foundation on SecureDrop, and one of the things that I think is interesting is that you build tools that are designed basically by default because they're technically non-compliant with the surveillance infrastructure of the globe, but then this is also in direct contradiction with sort of the centralization of the internet um, through places like, you know, all the news orgs might move their stuff to Amazon Web Services. And it's like, what does that mean for uh, a source who visits a potential, um, you know, landing page for Secure Drop? Um, so that is the thing that I've been concerned with. Um, and in previous projects, you know, one of the things we were investigating is how surveillance technologies are sort of um, the experiment is in, in sort of what we call the third world, but it's really, you know, poor brown folk. Um, and then re-imported into places like the United States, um, technologies like MC catchers and things like that. Um, and we really can't have this discussion about, you know, warrant requirements for people in the U.S. when these technologies are being sort of tested on vulnerable populations and re-imported. Um, into the U.S. with and so without bringing that discussion into it, we're we're missing half the story. Um, so that's another thing I think about quite a bit. Great. So we do have a big question here, um, and I know you guys are all probably tired of hearing I've got nothing to hide, <laughs> and we talk, and we talk about it amongst ourselves about what kinds of responses we have to that, and and yet we still are having this conversation with people. Um, how, do we get, how do we get ourselves beyond this? How do we, get, um, how do we work with the, the larger world to understand that they, should, they do have something to hide? Or um, yeah, that privacy does matter. So I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on how you all individually handle that, that kind of point that people make, that they've got, oh, I've got nothing to hide, so privacy doesn't matter. And how you handle that, and how we can continue to build that out beyond um, the, the communities that we all directly interact with to, to reach more communities? Well, uh, I, yeah, I guess I'll start off. Um, so I think it's a really basic uh, answer that um, maybe it's just hard to uh, articulate, but you, it's really perhaps easy to just give an example of why people put mail in envelopes versus writing on a postcard every single letter that they're going to write. It's not that you necessarily are writing something that's super private and like if someone opened the envelope it would be the end of the world for you, but you just like it's an extra step that you do because it's easy enough and um, you might as well if it's there. Um, I really liked the point that uh, Zuko brought up in his intro um, targeting the different like uh, liberals, conservatives, and libertarians, and why uh, they're interested, or why they would be interested in privacy, or why they should care about privacy. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, um, you just kind of have to like look at what the values are behind the person that you're talking to, or the group that you're talking to, um, and figure out what matters to them. So, um, with Zcash, for example, it's um, really good for individuals to have basic financial privacy. Um, um, a running joke slash meme, troll meme, is Bitcoin. It's like Twitter for your debit card. Um, so individuals are, you know, um, uh, individuals need that, you know, very basic privacy. And then on the alternative side, uh, businesses need uh, a very similar level of privacy uh, because they have competitors, market competitors, um, uh, supply chain, and all of that. So it's really about like figuring out who you're talking to. There isn't one big answer, I guess. Yeah, I agree with what Paige said, and we've 
heard this argument. I have nothing to hide, so I don't care about privacy while doing user testing for a product, GridSync. Uh, based on my experience, I feel when somebody makes that argument, never attack that person. Because there are many people who don't understand what's going on. They lack clarity. They don't have context. So it's really important do you understand their perspective, where are they coming from. So um, it's important that you let them explain why they think what they think. And then let them come up with reasons, and then give them point-to-point -point rebuttals. Like uh, one of the common reasons that I've heard is like, I have nothing to hide because I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not doing anything illegal. Uh, so my rebuttal to that is, Privacy is not about hiding. It's more about you having a control over your data. And if they say that I'm not doing anything illegal, then you can say what is legal today might change tomorrow because political landscape changes and it's happening a lot these days. So you have shared your data already, but it's legal. Maybe after 10 years it becomes illegal and your data is already there. So that can be used to frame charges against you and it can have serious consequences, not just on you, your family members, your friends, or anyone that you're communicating with. And the other common reason I've heard is like, uh, I'm a responsible citizen, but I'm like, you're not behaving responsibly because uh, by saying that you don't care about privacy, you're denying the right to privacy for certain people, which is, for them it's very important, like whistleblowers, or activists, or people who are working in dangerous conditions, so you're kind of absolving yourself from a social responsibility. So my point is, like, let them explain why they think that and then give, give them rebuttals to every reason they give you. Um, one of the things some people are like, oh, I'm an open person, I really don't care. Then you can give simple example that they can relate to. Like, if that's the case, give me a sheet of paper, write down login information of your bank account, or maybe a security deposit, and maybe I would have it in a binder and put it outside your house and people can just look at it and do whatever they want. Because this is exactly what's going on online. And I think when you give such simple examples or analogies that they are familiar with, people then understand that. And as Faith said, we have to understand where they're coming from. You need to understand the culture. You need to understand the age. Like example that I'm using for 20 year old might not be used for a 70 year old lady. So that depends. So yeah, so we have to come up with compelling reasons and it's subject to their, as I said, the culture and demographics. Thanks, that's a really good point. You know, for me, when I hear, but I have nothing to hide, I just tell that person they're already hiding a lot. I explain that the person that they are in front of their romantic partner is not the person they are at work. I explain that the person they are at work is not the person they are in front of their family. We are all compartmentalizing ourselves. Without privacy, whether it's digital or just having, uh, you know, blinds on your windows or some kind of drapes. You're, all of yourself is known and there's no way to control it. Your laptop and your phone, this thing you carry with you everywhere, knows everything about all of you and all those parts and is whispering to companies, to hackers, and to the general world. And if you don't care about your privacy, then you are at work acting like you're at a bar, you're with your family, but acting like you're with your romantic partner. And that's something that most people begin to understand. So that's my point. Yeah, I mean, I think that covers all of it. I also think we should remind people that there's lots of really personal stuff that they don't share by default, like their medical records. There's a reason that stuff's not public. Um, yeah, so that, that covers it, I guess. Thanks. I'm, so those are all really good ways to handle the conversations one-on-one -on -one with people. How do we take, how do we communicate this at a bigger scale? What are some impactful methods that you guys have found in terms of reaching a broader audience with these messages? And examples that you've seen used by yourselves or others recently and, and also the adaptation to the cultural differences that needs to be made when we're scaling these, these um, messages up? Yeah, okay. So um, one of the things that we were investigating like was MC catchers and you know, we ran one story about it and, and the police department didn't care. Um, and then we ran another story about it and then they didn't care. And I think we ran maybe four or five different stories and then 
actually we had you know politicians and civil groups and things like that begin to reach out. So one of the things that you have to do is remember that like powerful institutions, um, you know, they have internal ways of managing sort of dissent against them. Um, but really, like, if you want to push on things that cover things like privacy and surveillance, you really just have to keep hitting them and hitting them and hitting them until the situation becomes so untenable that they, they're moved to act. Um, so I found that that's one useful way of, of doing things, especially when we're talking about reclaiming privacy for um, individuals, especially in the context of a political action. Um, so that's one sort of thing that I've found works really well. Um, and this is replicated a couple of different times in other projects that we've worked on, yeah. You know, one thing that I find really impactful is I talk about death and I talk about money. War and the money that comes from war and the science on how to kill people better and faster is where the tools of surveillance come from. GPS, cell site simulators, everything that you can think of was developed to make money as an arms dealer would. With this new idea that data is currency, with this idea that you can swing an election with misinformation and ads, with this idea that you can have cyber, this new element of war, you are kind of at a point where if you don't fight against these tools, you're being part of killing people. And there's a death of privacy that comes from bullets and bombs, but those bullets and bombs look like cool features. They look like ones and zeros. But this is where it came from. If you follow where this stuff was invented and if you follow the money that came from it, you will see that it comes from a horrible place. And every cool use of every cool feature you've thought of and that every app uses uh, was not designed to help people, human beings, or society, but to hurt it. So, you know, I'm interesting. I, I usually talk to people about cryptocurrencies from not a capitalist point of view, from a humanist point of view, from a human rights defense point of view. And I challenge people to try to understand that. We're at a kind of point where we can take things back and correct a lot of mistakes, or we can keep going the way we're going. Um, I think a really good way to talk to, like, even the general public from, um, you know, with any kind of background is just kind of showing them examples of where uh, systems have failed. Um, and this is kind of where, I guess, privacy and security are really related. So you can point to examples where um, security systems have just completely failed because, a, you know, a database has been um, really insecure and therefore um, information about millions of individuals have been leaked out. Um, so I think the easiest way for me that I've found is using these examples that are just concrete, widespread, you know, um, when uh, I think it was like last year when uh, voter registration data was leaked within the US, it affected like a third of registration or something like that, or at 50%, something like that. Um, you know, all of the kind of mainstream things that get, uh, that get talked about, um, people do forget, but you just gotta kind of keep reminding them um, of these kind of big catastrophic things. And it's kind of hard, I feel like it's really difficult to like preempt such things, but like making the best of like the, the really bad outcomes of, of horrible security and privacy practices um, is uh, pretty concrete for a lot of people. They can see it in their minds. They can see that, you know, they had to, they or someone that you probably know had to go uh, change a credit card or, you know, whatnot. Um, I think uh, educating privacy starts at home. You can start with your parents, with your friends and relatives. And I can just give you an example. Uh, so I grew up in India. Um, and, you know, in Indians, are, they live in a socially dense environment. There's no concept of privacy as such in India. 
uh, they confuse privacy with luxury, and they think it's um, it's it's for rich people, right? So, um, so in that kind of environment, when I talk to my mom, I'm just giving a personal example. So when I talk about privacy, and I, if I tell her, like, you should care about privacy because somebody's going to hack your account, she will never listen to me because, like, what are you talking about? And she loses interest in that. So then I have to find out something really simple that she understands. So, like, she often complains to us, like, people call her, give random sales call, or people show up at their door and they kind of entice them to buy something which they actually don't need. She ends up buying that but regrets it later and she complains it to us. And then she says, I've been asking these people, how did you get my phone number, my address? And they never tell me, they're companies. So then I was like, this is exactly what I'm talking about. This is privacy. While looking for a gift for your granddaughter online, Maybe you gave away your phone number and address, and now these people have all your data, and they're bothering you all the time. So when I use that language, then she understands. But if I tell her you should care about privacy, then she gets offended. It's like, you cannot tell me to stay away from my friends and relatives because I live all alone here, so that I'm close to them. So this is what I'm talking about. You have to use data to examples, and always, like, as I said before, it depends on who you're talking to. So. I don't know whether I answered the question, but yeah, that's like one way I try to address this privacy issue. So where do we go from here? Um, what, a, what do we do for next steps? How do we, how do we um, build communities around these values? How do we communicate on and, and get the message? Do we create market demands? Do we educate better? Do we do legal activism? What, what do you guys think from your experiences that we should do next? I would say keep doing what we're doing. Um, I don't think we need to convince literally everyone that privacy matters. Uh, there needs to be some critical point maybe, at least for in terms of like market demand um, and like try, like use, using tools that uh, implement privacy or getting tools to add privacy where they lacked it previously. Um, and yeah, just getting some sort of net, network effects don't work, uh, don't require everyone to be into it. So. Keep doing, uh, keep talking about it to your communities, your friends. Um, if you like, if you like talking about privacy, I definitely recommend like starting a small crypto party or something in your area. You might as well give it a shot, even if like five people show up. It's still, it's still fun. Like even when not many people show up, you still get to talk about things. Um, try to. Um, Keep it open um, and not be too jargony. Um, try to make it family friendly so people can like bring their kids. Maybe like I've found that um, uh, anecdotally, um, well, I have hosted crypto parties, but they've all been like at nighttime. So it's mostly just like adults after work kind of thing. Um, I've been suggested to do things on the weekends where people can like bring their whole family um, so you know just like play around with things keep um, communicating with your um, with your local community and the people you're already in contact with don't like try to think too big as an individual just like affect where you can affect I guess yeah that's my advice <laughs> Uh, my advice is to dismantle power and dismantle oppression when you see it. And what that might look like is just using, you know, cryptocurrencies. I had a, an event. I, I work in the inner city with my crypto parties. And I had an event, and I was like, hey, come in if you want to learn about this thing called Bitcoin. I took a, couple, um, a big stack of cash, and I turned it to Bitcoin. Cut up pieces of paper, whatever amount you picked out, you got, you know? At the time, we just had a bunch of like mycelium wallets, made them real quick. People got like 20 bucks, five bucks, 10 bucks, and I was like, listen, you don't need a passport. You don't need ID. You don't need to be from one border or outside another border. This is yours. This is how you use it. This is how you trade stuff. This is how you sell stuff. It's empowering. It's empowering to not have rules. It's empowering to not have delays for no reason. And a lot of those centralized misuse of power, we can do away with. We can start over. 
And now those people are sitting on money. People hit me up on Twitter like, dude, I got $1,000. I'm like, think past that money. Think about that power, you know? A friend of mine, uh, Zucky, taught me a lot about that stuff. So I would just say, you know, you can start having that crypto party in your community, talking to your friends and family, and know that these individual acts have huge ramifications. Um, I mean, I, th I think we, we always kind of default to kind of technical solutions. Um, and yeah, so I, I think we should avoid that. Um, we should talk about political solutions. Um, we didn't find ourselves in a position where, you know, I, I really like sci-fi movies, um, but like RoboCop didn't like happen and, you know, the corporation is named you know, uh, whatever it was, Omnicore, right? It's called Google, right? It, and like, it's just like the RoboCops of today are just like much, much dumber versions of the RoboCop visualization from 30 years ago. Um, so, and, and I think we should think about why that is. It has to do with political actions. It has to do with the last 40, 50 years of um, how things have evolved in the, in the, in the world. Um, so, I mean, I think technically, I think we should think about sort of building things that are secure by default through insecurity. I mean, I think Cubes does this very well. Um, but also, we should really think about how did we get to this point and think really, really deeply. So, I don't really have a vision for the future because I think we need to really think about the past um, and, and the present because, you know, the past or the, well, the future is the present and the past. And so, yeah, so I don't have an answer, um, but I think we should think about the question much harder. Um, and I think if we better understand the questions, then we'll, we'll find a way forward. Yeah, I want to add to that. I mean, these are great suggestions, but I also think that we need to include privacy in our uh, school curriculum. The other day I was talking to my nephew who studies computer science and apparently there's a lot of material about data retrieval methods and how to improve it, but there's not much about the importance of privacy and the potential negative impact of these technologies. Again, uh, I go to all these conferences. We talk a lot about like IoT, smart cities, smartphones, and smart homes, uh, but nobody, I mean, really there are sessions about the potential negative impact like privacy, uh, I mean, these things are great, but they're not great news for privacy. So people generally don't seem to be talking about that much. So I think we need to communicate a lot. We are not, because we are not communicating enough about the importance of privacy. And these kind of conferences or events or meetups and all these suggestions, uh, I think they, they will really help. So 2018, here we are, January 3rd. <laughs> um, I've got two questions for you all. Um, one is, if there's anything that you could see happen in 2018 to help privacy for everyone, what would it be? And if you could tell the, one world, the world one message about privacy, what would that be? Uh, you know, as a hacker, it seems like a lot of positive stuff comes from a lot of chaotic action. I remember when security and privacy sections of an app, that would be ridiculous to create that. Now it's something that the people want, but why do the people want it? It comes from feeling digitally unsafe without that. So what I would like to see in 2018, which I think is inevitable, is more digital destruction and digital chaos. Um, to, so we have this, this is the thread, it's, it's obvious. And so you understand, I need this umbrella, I need this uh, shelter. And, um, I don't know, I think like the second part of the question was... Um, if you could tell the world one message about privacy, oh, yeah. what would it be? I mean, I would tell the world that, you know, I, I do work um, with people who are high risk. You know, I go to them. You're an opposition leader, you're a human rights defender, and it's not easy work. Making sure that their privacy, their security, their operational security is good so they can like live another day and continue their good work. But the first thing I teach them is the thing that they teach you when you're like working for a government or, or you're in an embassy. It's like, you're in charge of your own security. You're in charge of your own privacy. No one's gonna say, it's not safe to come in today. You've gotta make that decision. And most people aren't educated 
enough to understand how to make that decision. And um, yeah, I think it's, like, it's up to you, it's on you. Um, I, I think I would have to agree that this, this year, probably we're just going to keep seeing more like chaos and, you know, just like vulner the vulnerabilities and all of the software are just going to keep coming out. Um, and I guess just be ready to try to capitalize on that. Um, <laughs> um, not, uh, it's, not to say that like this collateral damage is like a good thing, but it's pr it's kind of inevitable. So do what you will with it. Um, and I guess the one thing I would have to say about privacy um, is that privacy is dignity, and um, we should all be kind of like pushing that message out to people that it's just a basic human thing, just like dignity is. Uh, one good thing that's happening this year is GDPR. It's coming to effect in May, so I think that will have some impact, a positive impact, because it does not apply only to European companies, but to any company uh, which is providing service and product to people living in Europe. So it's going to have a huge impact. Uh, the message that I want to give is uh, right to privacy is right to self. I think it's privacy that makes you, you. So you protect your privacy and protect yourself. I, one bit of advice I would give is, you know, we have to think like all this chaos is going on and we want to be chaotic good and all these things. Um, but I, th I think the most important thing is to be decided and to say, yo, here are the principal stances that I'm going to make. Um, that I will not waver on. So, you know, it personally, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I, well, I won't give them my whole backstory. But, the, but you know, uh, yeah, the most important thing is to be decided. And it, you can easily find yourself in a situation when someone's giving you $300,000 a year and you're holding on to, like, you know, Google's whatever data or building data lakes or whatever it is. And, and so, so you can easily find yourselves in traps. So the most important thing is to have principles and stick with them and be decided that the, this is the person I'm going to be. Um, because no one's ever going to say, hey, you know, you backed out on that. Um, so that's, that's what I would say. My message for 2018 in regards to privacy is, um, well, I'll give a professional pitch. If you are in, the, the, in Europe, uh, convince newsrooms to install SecureDrop. Cool. All right, well, you guys have been wonderful on this panel, and I wanted to give the audience a chance to ask any questions. All right. So, um, <clears throat> is, is privacy bad? Right? I mean, we have these situations where we have, you know, hidden ultra-wealthy individuals hiding their bank accounts for tax evasion, right? We have uh, secret policy decisions and hidden meetings of the government where they're using privacy to exploit, uh, you know, the citizens. Uh, you know, we have this uh, example of radical transparency in a group like the Pirate Party um, using the lack of privacy to kind of further the group's goals and, and, and benefit society. Right, we have shadow brokers using Zcash to profit off of killing medical devices, right? Um, so is it, I mean, can we think of it more as like a control over the monopoly of these types of privacy decisions, right? Because, you know, these, these groups are able to have privacy while others are not, right? And, and, and it's not just, you know, per personal privacy, it's organizational, uh, you know, governmental, uh, commercial privacy. You know, and, and, and how, how do you define this conversation? This is my question, you guys. You know, how do, how do we define this conversation? How do we talk about, you know, privacy as a framework, not just, you know, I don't want people knowing what shoes I bought, but rather, you know, I, I'm part of a society that's using privacy in these different ways. How do we talk about that? Uh, you know, I, I would say you made some examples of people doing, you know, unscrupulous things, but 
privacy is like literacy. You know, you can read science books and create a cure for a horrible disease and give out medicine for free. Or you can read, you know, how to rob a bank or how to hurt someone. Um, horrible, powerful people will use stuff to maintain their horrible powerfulness. You know, like whenever um, good people have a small win, those people have a small loss. And good people tend not to have privacy. They don't understand that, you know, this is what allows me to have strength. So I would say, and you know, when, when those people have big losses and good people have big wins, then you know, it's all part of the same thing. So there is a structure. The way things are, everything that's good and everything's bad, is held together by a web of privacy. And if you want to make a change, you've got to understand how to control your privacy and take advantage of your privacy. I, I mean, I, I'm all about decentralization. We don't need to, yeah, we, I, I think we don't need to formalize it. We just need to say, hey, you know, you know Panama Papers, right? Remember that? Like, you know, that's, that's an example of just a little glimpse. I mean, I know Bono's not stoked right now, but hey, we can see through, uh, through the hard work of journalists, investigative reporters, and researchers, a lot of stuff. You know, hackers who go in and take intelligence communities' tools and spill them on the internet for the highest bidder, there's something to be said for these tools now we know they exist. So I think there's nothing wrong with shaking things up a little bit. You just need to understand that like, privacy is what power is maintained by. Yeah, I totally agree. And also, one good thing about um, uh, the, these like central power structures is that they're very easy to be made targets of, whereas individuals are less likely to be targets. So um, in the end, where these power structures are um, using these tools for you know uh, bad purposes or whatever, then um, uh, they're going to be pointed out more by yes journalists and whatnot. So um, I think that that just that central dynamic is is a natural thing and we'll see um, we'll see the people the bad people the really powerful people using uh, privacy for bad things um, or to conceal their their bad practices um, it'll just become more and more difficult the more spotlight that people put on them cool um, so yeah thanks very much for all of your contributions I think that was really insightful. I just wanted to zone in on what you said, Freddie, at the beginning about, um, say, the servers and the, the chain of, of privacy. So I know, I know we've built, again and again, we've built privacy-preserving pre tools for journalists, for activists, and we've put every consideration into what happens to data, and then we end up deploying it somewhere like you know, AWS or DigitalOcean, and it looks like no matter how much effort you take to... Um, protect the user's data, it looks like you have to put it out there in the cloud and then you've lost all that. I mean, what mechanisms do we have to take the ideals of end-to-end -end messaging and start to build maybe end-to-end -end systems? Is that, is that in the pipeline? Is that realistic? Yes, I mean, so this is, a, this is a, I guess, a technical question that I don't see an answer to, at least not in the way of current economic models. So. I think it's worth pointing out that it's not an accident that every, you know, 10% of the internet is routed through Cloudflare. Um, opinions of Cloudflare aside, you know, this paints a very, very large target for very, very important models. Um, and, and so I don't see a way forward in a way where the business model of Cloudflare is to get more and more traffic um, through their pipeline. So I don't see a way forward with that, um, at least not in the current ec economic model. But I think it's worth thinking about uh, be very deeply because uh, if we build the best you know, software, everything's routed through Tor, and we're making payments through Zcash, and all these other things, but really 90% of you know, the internet routes through, or maybe say 10%, routes through one provider, well, then the government can just go to Cloudflare and, and they don't actually need to get a, well, they, they would need to get a warrant, but, but there's no way for us to defend against that, right? Um, so my answer is I don't know because I don't, I think that that question is in a political economic framework that I don't see as, I, I, I don't see a way forward in, the, in this framework. Um, but it's worth discussing. 
Um, so we can get into it a bit later. And I think the people need to solve their own problems, and that's why, you know, with things like Briar and decentralized things that aren't central, you know, we look at conditions in Iran right now. You can't use Signal because it needs to go through Google Play Store, and Google says, oh, you know, there's an embargo, so we want to turn off that, so you can't use this app. So we're always going to be caught by these snags if we're trying to build stuff in the West for, you know, oppressed poor brown people or oppressed poor Muslim people. But if you have something in your pocket for the people around you, maybe we need to start thinking of those types of solutions because then they're a little bit more um, totalitarian, authoritarian, dictator-proof, right? Okay, um, maybe one more question. Sure. So if I could, I'd just like to share uh, what is by far the most um, compelling uh, answer that I've heard before to the question of why does privacy matter? And the, and the answer I've heard is, if you look at it from the NSA's perspective, and they have dirt on every man, woman, and child, they could, for example, selectively leak information about a political candidate that's going to like threat, you know, threaten their budget or something, selectively leak damaging things about them to the media, and then we as a democracy, we're trying to decide which candidates are good, which ones are bad, and we have this like out, you know, like overweighed uh, like kind of data about one candidate, and that could thereby undermine democracy. Um, and related to that, um, uh, the other answer being, if, if it's not safe for sources to give information to journalists, then, um, then we don't get that information and we can't decide, you know, we can't make decisions as a, as a democracy as well. Thank you. Okay, well, that wasn't totally a question, but <laughs> we'll keep going. So, um, yeah, I think that's all we'll do for today on this panel, and you all are welcome to continue the conversation on the breaks and everything. So thank you again, uh, panelists. <laughs>